audiophile. Noun. One who is attracted to intelligence. Join us, fellow fun-loving lover of knowledge, as we dig into your favorite topics with our very own nerdy diatribes, words of wisdom, and takes on life as millennials. Welcome to the Sapio Files. Hi everybody, this is Kayla. And this is Chelsea. Welcome back. Welcome back. And as you can maybe hear based on the quality of my voice, I am with Chelsea again. Yay! So like the fall is cool because she's all over the place, so I get her for chunks of the time, which is nice. It is very, very nice. And you know, where in the world is Kayla San Diego land? Without the kleptomania. Yeah, she's not a kleptomaniac. <laughs> yes, exactly. In any case, in order to explain this particular topic, I want to tell you a story. Tell us a story, Kayla. So, in addition to my long drives, a big part of my job is going to events and fairs and conferences. And the conferences are actually one of my favorite parts of my job because if I could go to school full time, I totally would. This is the Sapio Files. I would, after all. I would too. If I had the money and the time, <laughs> exactly. I would just keep getting degrees. In any case, I have been to several conferences, all of which have been incredibly helpful for me with my career. However, within all of these conferences, I've noticed a trend. Um, but this incident happened my second year of work. I was attending a conference and within that conference, there was a session on the generations and how to deal with the generations in the workplace and basically how to utilize certain characteristics that are a part of being a iGen or a millennial or an Xer or a baby boomer and then using those in order to become a better coworker. Mm -hmm. So I was excited for this because as a millennial, I am always um, very, very open to, you know, figuring out ways that I can become more of a team player and learning how I can accommodate others in the workplace. But what I found was that it was actually just an entire session of bashing the millennial generation. And this is unfortunately not uncommon. No. And the kicker was people were actually saying things when we broke into like small group discussions about millennials bashing them. And then when it came time for the Q&A, I actually stood up and said I was a millennial and people were shocked as if I was this rare unicorn within my generation that suddenly was a good one. Which is super confusing because if you're not a millennial, what are you? You don't look old enough to be an extra. You don't look young enough to be an iGen. I don't know what they think you are. Exactly. So I was just very disheartened because while I understand that there are negative and positive qualities of any group or individual, no matter when they were born or where they fall in age order, it I thought it was going to be more about analyzing the strengths and weaknesses of each generation and talking about how they all can work together rather than basically what they did was troubleshoot millennials so, story. Because they didn't talk about the good and bad things of each generation, we're going to do it. Yay! Yay! So we also noticed that in our little intro when I'm, you know, talking over that like cha 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 music, um, that we, we mentioned being millennials and we haven't really talked about what that means. Mm -hmm. Uh, a lot of older generations love to bash the millennials, but don't necessarily know what what it actually means. And a lot of them use the word millennial as a synonym for young, which is not necessarily the truth any longer. Millennials, and there are there's some debate about the years, different versions have it in different years, but millennials for the most part are people born between 1983 and 1996. Which makes the youngest millennials 22 years old. We're not kids. We're adults. We're, part, we're a big part of the workforce. We're adults in our 20s and 30s. So we're not kids. And a lot of times when people use millennials as a synonym for young kids, they're actually referring to the iGen generation. Which, by the way, the, a lot of their young behaviors are because they're teenagers. I don't believe that their generation is any more flaky than any other generation either. So iGens, if you're listening, I know many of you, I work with many of you as a teacher, you guys have a lot of great things about you too. 
So this is not to bash iGens either. It's just to say that millennials are not the young group you think they are. Millennials are 22 to, what is it, 35? Yes. To 35. 22 to 35 is a millennial. So that's that's adults. That's our group. There are no millennials who are too young to drink anymore. Exactly. And I also, I've been insulted a couple times, and people didn't even mean to do it, where they gave me their smartphone and said, how do I do this like random app? And I hadn't heard of it. And they said, what kind of millennial are you? And I said, not an iGen. Because I don't, because there's certain apps I don't know that they do know. And it's... Also, let's talk about technology and generations for just a second before we dive into all of this. So people in general, and there, there there is some truth to this because of the world we grew up in. People in general think millennials know all there is to know about technology and no one else does. Now, I'm pretty good at technology. You're pretty good at technology. But in general, it's not because you're millennials. It's because that's what you grew up having to do. There's no way we could have passed college without understanding the basis of technology. However, I don't want to hear anybody say you're too old for technology because the best person at technology that I know in my entire life is my mom. She's phenomenal. She knows things that, I mean, I'm pretty good. But she understands the coding behind it. She understands many, many nuances of it. And yes, that's her career. But it's not something that she just learned in college and has carried on. She graduated from college many moons ago. You know, hi, mom. I'm not calling you super old. You just are my mom. You're just my mom. And, you know, I'm an adult. So you are an older adult, you are a baby boomer, and we love the baby boomers. We do. So, my mom, who is a baby boomer, is the best person at technology that I know, and in fact, when I get stuck and I can't troubleshoot something, I call her. Before I call the tech people at my work. I've actually called your mom about before the tech, tech, people, before at tech work. people at work. So, don't say you're too old for technology because you're lying. You just haven't continued to learn. So, I digress into that technology rant, but yes... As millennials, we are people who grew up with computers, but not necessarily all the other gadgets. And maybe not grew up with from, like, little kid age, but at least by middle school, we're proficient in using computers. Yes. That said, we also were the generation that grew up still learning the Dewey Decimal System. We did. We still, we had dial-up internet. We had to not make a, you know, have our friends call call Mm -hmm. when we were going to go on the internet to get research for a paper. So well, it's... these millennials are our branch of the millennials, like the, in the middle, we're like the second of four children millennials. Yes, exactly. So 30 the, year olds. The elder millennials. The elder millennials, like Eliza As says. As Eliza says in her comedy you guys should all watch that. It's great. Um, well, we're not the elder elders. We're just a little bit elder. We're not the oldest child. We're the second oldest child. We're the second of four. Of the millennials. Second so of four. perhaps the the young millennials, the 22 to 24 year old millennials, perhaps they didn't have dial up internet. But. But it's the same kind of idea in that the technology was prevalent, but it wasn't so ingrained in the in our day to day life as it is now. The iGens, the younger generation, they're named for iPhone, mm-hmm. iGen. Um, they are the ones who grew up constantly connected. So that is that difference. So, just to, you know, keep a perspective on what that means. So, anyway, should we talk about some more millennial fun facts? Absolutely. Chelsea has done an amazing job looking up these exciting facts. There are approximately 92 million millennials. This is compared to 77 million baby boomers, who are the generation that is primarily our parents. So a lot of these statistics are comparing us to our parents' generation. So it is skipping over that extra generation in the middle. Um, Xers who primarily are the parents of the iGens. So later when these iGens start growing up and join the workforce, we'll, they'll probably have similar studies with the iGens versus the Xers as we yes. have with the boomers and us. So ours are us as, par- as opposed to our parents' generation. So right now we actually make up half of the current workforce. Which is impressive. Adjusting for inflation, however, and here's where we get into some of those misconceptions. 
millennials are sometimes seen as lazy, entitled, constantly, you know, wanting handouts from their parents or uh, they're called sometimes called the boomerang generation or the Peter Pans that like go back to live with their parents after they're out. There's a reason. It has nothing to do with the actual mentality of the generation. I mean, I'm not no, I'm not saying there are no lazy millennials because there are lazy people in every generation. Very but true. Adjusting for inflation, the average worker ages 24 to 36 makes 10,000 less a year than the boomers did in similar fields with education levels. So someone who had your job with your education level in at your age in the boomer generation, it doesn't sound like more because you're forgetting about inflation, but adjusting for inflation, wages have not risen with inflation and we make approximately 10,000 less a year. Which is, that is saying something. Um, so there's a reason with that. Despite this, we save at only 1% less than baby boomers did on average at our age. So we do still put money away. We are still careful with money. In fact, it's a smarter, it's a very smart group with money. Um, yeah. Especially because there's so much debt. I'd say that of the people in our generation that I've spoken with, in the workplace and amongst my friends that if anything, like we're overly concerned with money. We're so yes. hyper aware of mm -hmm. its existence or lack thereof in our lives. Well, the median income of a millennial is you ready for this? 33,882 a year. That's that not sinking. a lot. And I mean, that's just of all millennials altogether. That's the average. So you have to take that into account. A lot of them only have part-time work. A lot of them only have, minimum wage work and it's and they're overqualified millennials are also the most educated generation 63 percent of millennials have a bachelor's degree which is pretty good that is pretty good and 32 percent have advanced degrees yay yay, yay us with advanced degrees <laughs> and maybe you if you're listening to the sapio files <laughs> or maybe you just think we're funny i don't know we can be kind of entertaining. Both can be true. <laughs> um, but even if you don't have an advanced degree, we are the best educated group in U.S. history. That's and pretty awesome. probably across the, the world, too. This statistic, these statistics were United States mm -hmm. statistics, but probably across the world. Which, ironically, is probably why we are underpaid for what we the positions that we hold because the of our education levels because oftentimes they can't keep up with our education levels mm -hmm. and that's probably contributing to the underemployment. I'm not saying mm -hmm. unemployment. Underemployment. Underemployment. There's, There's a huge difference but yeah. it's still an issue. So. Also, a great, another great fact about how millennials handle money. We are more likely to spend money on experiences than objects and despite all of the financial things, 81% have donated to a charity, maybe not all the time, maybe not an extreme amount, but 81% of millennials have used some of their money towards charity, which is, which is great. Mm -hmm. So there is that. It's not a, it's not that we're not working hard. And I think that's a misconception. Probably, I think it's a misconception that's going away a bit as we get older. Now they're going to switch to the iGens. They're going to say the iGens are entitled. We're the so iGens sorry, are you guys, hard. if any iGens are listening. It's coming for you, it's coming. but <laughs> we love you, and we know we mm -hmm. know what it's like, so, you know, call us up, and, um, you know, we'll we'll help you out. You know, I have, some, I have some awesome younger friends and students and people in the iGen. And my youngest group. brother is an iGen. He's awesome. He's great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, hey, Aiden. Hi, Aiden. I don't know if Aiden listens to this, but if you're listening, Aiden, hey. He'll probably catch up after the semester. He's an engineering student, so. See? <laughs> iGens work hard. They do. <laughs> Very smart college boy. Mm hmm All right. So, um, those are some facts about millennials and money. Also, 35% have started their own businesses. Yeah, we are a very entrepreneurial generation. We are. Also, more tolerant than any other older generation, according to implicit association studies. I believe this was just racial bias, but it could have included other biases. I'm not sure where the statistic exactly is, but 40%, 47% do not show 
implicit racial bias compared to 19% of baby boomers who do not show implicit racial bias. And that's not saying that baby boomers are racist. It's very different. Implicit versus explicit. There's a big difference. Explicit is you are outwardly racist. You are making decisions that will negatively affect people of other races. Implicit is that because of your experience, you just have a a bias or a favoritism of people like you. I, I guess a perfect example would be that um, I'm reading a book right now by Jodi Picoult, so I know exactly the perfect example. So explicit racism would be telling an uh, incredibly qualified nurse who is black that she can't work with your baby when you're white. That is explicit racism and horrendous, by mm-hmm. the way. Implicit racism is if two nurses walk into a room and one is white and one is black and the woman that is black has more experience, you automatically ask questions of the one that is white, assuming that the black American has less experience. Right. So and without consciously deciding. Yeah. That's the difference. Mm-hmm. It's not a conscious decision in your mind. So you're not saying, oh, I don't trust black people. Let me talk to the white doctor. It's just like a mistake. A mistake that, that, that your you, brain that automatically does without you thinking about it. Yes. Yeah. So implicit racism. Still so, not great at all. Not good, um, but it's very it's very different than being explicitly racist. And you know uh, what? Absolutely. People have unconscious biases and that doesn't make them bad people. So if you are someone who, if you were to take that implicit association test and it does show a bias, that doesn't mean that you are outwardly racist or a bad person or even conscious of it at all. You could consciously believe that you are welcoming and open to everybody and that is true for how you behave and act in the world it might just be that in your experience more of your friends are a particular race and that's what you associate with good things and that's okay so we're not we're not saying i don't i don't want any of this to be like against other generations no. but comparatively to our parents generation 47 percent don't show bias which is great right. versus 19 percent. and and to that generation's credit there must have been something that those individuals did in order to instill in us that less Well, they were the movers and shakers of the civil rights movement. So, So, you know, go you guys. So maybe, like, what you guys did helped us become more tolerant, so... Well, hey, you know what? The way that... We gotta also... I know a lot of this is gonna be our parents' generation, the boomers, but you know what? The boomers made us. They raised us. We love the boomers, by the way. Hey, boomers! Hey, boomers! (laughs) I know there's a bunch of you listening. Um, so, yeah, we love you guys. We have friends in that generation, aside from oh, our parents. Yeah. Completely. So, you know, good group of people. And they are the ones who raise the millennials. So, as much as people like to say lazy, entitled, all kinds of craziness, um, you know, all the good parts come from our parents, for the most part. Mm-hmm. Our influences growing up, whether it's our parents mm-hmm. or teachers or aunts and uncles or other adults Mm -hmm. so that's awesome um anyway other interesting facts so we are more tolerant we do have the most education uh lower median median income especially when taking into account inflation um we have average on average debt is double what our parents was. Yeah. Um, and so these are all, these are all interesting facts. Another one is um, the marriage rate at different ages. This one. Pretty interesting. I know we tend to get into a panic of like, okay, well, why aren't more millennials getting married earlier? And are we going to be too old? And I, I've had this panic. I've had this panic recently. I'm like, okay, you know, I'm 30. I'm not married Am I going to get there fast enough to have kids? But a lot of this is education and working hard and becoming solid individuals before tying to someone else. And that makes that makes the divorce rate go down too. Mm-hmm. So this statistic I thought was interesting. 23% of millennials, or at least the older millennials, are married by 31. So... Millennials 31 and older, 23% of them are married. Or were married by 31. Mm. 56% of the baby boomers were. 
And that's big. And that number goes up and up and up in past generations too. I remember uh, talking to my grandma and she was like, I was such an old maid when I got married. I was so old. All my friends were married. They were like, you're never going to get married. I'm like, well, when did you get married, grandma? She's like, I had just turned 25. (laughs) So like that sounds really young to me. It does. And I think we also have to take into consideration that with each generation with the percentage of people getting married young in each generation going down as the years progress, that percentage can also be attributed to, in some part, the fact that women power were in the workplace too and in high yeah. powered jobs. So like it's as things like that have, has, have happened, I feel like. And the main goal is not to be a housewife. The main goal is to find a supportive partner. Exactly. So it's not because you need your husband's money or you just need, like, a baby daddy. No. It's to find... Well, no, some people... Some people need a baby daddy. I know. No. But it's to find someone to do life with. Mm-hmm. So that's harder. That's a harder sell. It is. And I think it's good that people are taking their time and making good decisions. And finding their partner. Like, their true partner. Not yes. just... I, I think that's something that's... As well as the fact that I can work in whatever job I want to... I think that finding the appropriate partner and really taking that time to bond is important too. Yes. Absolutely. So, yeah, those are some. Also, how about all those women in in Congress? Yeah. You know, whatever your politics are, whether they are the particular candidate you voted for or not, it's pretty cool how many women and minorities have been elected to Congress Mm -hmm. in these midterm elections. Yeah. That's cool. And, you know, it was kind of a split election. Uh, People on both sides. But I think that that check and balance is a good thing. And some cool, new, historic people. I know. We got, what do we have? A lot of women. We have first Native first American, Muslim. Muslim woman, youngest uh, women ever to youngest, get elected. Open, uh, openly gay. Yeah. A lot of things. So, so many Very cool. Things. Yeah, so, um, we, yeah, we don't get married as early. And we have a different, a different world than... Our parents did. Another thing that we have to remember is that when we, at least the older millennials, were in high school or entered college, the world was very different. The world looked entirely different than the world you graduated into. So, you know, the misconceptions about being lazy, demanding, wanting to be handed bigger jobs, paychecks. The truth is, I think that people just want to be paid with their worth and they want to be treated as they're worth. And we entered the worst job market since the Great Depression. Mm-hmm. We graduated into that. And we were set up and entered college with different views about what the world was supposed to be. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I remember in high school, I think it was, I think my dad had said something about like, you guys aren't going to have any problems finding a job. It'll be, it'll be fine. Just like pick a major that you're going to do well in in college and it'll be fine. You'll... Yeah, it was, it was. And that wasn't him misleading us. That was the truth before we went into college. Same. I remember getting the talk that, like, as long as you work hard and you do well in school, you won't have a problem getting a job because they'll notice how, you mm-hmm. know, adaptive and intellectual and independent you are. And, they'll and just... that is just not, unfortunately, the, <laughs> not case the case that we graduated into. So because of that, I feel like we sort of got a bad rap for being lazy and entitled. And why are you living in your parents' basement? Well, mom and dad, because... No one's paying me. <laughs> Not me personally. I don't live in my parents' basement. But no, but no one's paying us. I should say no one's paying us. Yeah, it's a generation. Yeah, I mean, and the underemployment rate yeah. is a big deal. So we have those issues. Um, I've also heard things about the housing market. Oh my gosh, yes. So there's a lot of complaints that millennials are ruining the housing market because we're not buying homes in the same percentages that previous generations did. Um, For many of us, that is because the taxes on a house are more than rent. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And we don't make that kind of money. However, 93% of millennials say they aspire to be homeowners. So I would think that as the economy rebounds, hopefully, Mm -hmm. at some point, and um, (laughs) it will eventually. Please. (laughs) Yeah, it'll, it'll rebound. Um... And as we get higher up into the job market, and as we as we advance, our loans. pay off loans, 
I would think that there will be an increase in home ownership. So that's... Michael has always been like, once you're done paying off your student loans, then buy a house. Yeah. Like, it's like... Same. No. So, you know, I think that that's a big deal. Um, But you have to be financially stable. So, like, once I feel financially stable, fine. But until then, renting is okay. I feel like we're also very, like, the whole house thing can be very directly tied to the marriage thing because Mm -hmm. I feel like we're a very realistic generation too in that we know that like buying a house or putting a down payment on a house is not the only payment you'll have on the house nor is the nor are the taxes you're Mm -hmm. you're renovating that house you're putting furniture into that house and we we it's a it's a constant investment these are things we think about yeah so and remember we are more aware and frugal mm -hmm. with money so that is another thing also, here's, you know, you mentioned being realistic with houses. Here's just a question, a debate question. Okay. What is your opinion? And I've heard many things on both sides of this from different generations, from our generation. What is your opinion on people, couples living together before they're married? I think, I mean, living together or buying a house together? I don't know. Either living... Okay, because living, I mean, living together. Because, Let's go with that one because first. Because I feel like if you're buying a house together, that's our that's like saying like I'm committed 100. percent So like yeah. even if you never get married, say you you're not a marriage person, at least you know you're committed to you're that committed. couple. Committed. Um. So my opinion is that you know I would want to know if the person I'm living with is going to be someone that I can actually live with. Yeah. Um. I'm not saying that if if you're someone that doesn't believe in that, then you do you. Oh, totally. Um, and if you're someone that, you know, has lived with the, your partner since graduation from college and you're going to get married and you're taking that long to get married, then that's your life as well. Oh, you know, we're live. It's just, it's just an opinion. I, I've heard a lot of strong opinions on I this. I think that it's, I think personally that it's fine. Mm-hmm. Um, I, for me, personally, would like to, if that was my situation, I wouldn't want to be in a let's live together for seven years and then get married situation. I would hope that I would get married before that. Um, well, at this point in life, yes. Yeah. Um, cause I mean, both of us are in our early thirties or 30. We're both 30. Um, yeah. so there's a difference, but if people want to move in together and decide whether or not they're compatible with one another, go for it. It's better to have a breakup than to like find out I later that you're going to then have to go through a divorce. And- not everybody is someone you can live with, even like great friends. Some of them you can't live with. And I think that the idea of living together before you're married has, has been more normalized for our generation it too. It's, I, I've heard... it's never been something that I've been like, oh my God. No, like, I've, I, no I guess mostly older generations. Older generations. But I, I've heard that argument that is it just not being committed and is it just being in like the gray area forever because you're not getting married, you're just already like acting like you're married and I mean I think it has to do with your relationship itself if your relationship is solid and you have a plan for where it's going if you're just moving in with someone for the hell of it for really no reason other than I mean actually to save money is a reason that's a solid reason I I should say if it's a logical step in the development of your relationship I'm all for it Uh, yes I I would agree if it's not because you both have discussed the finances and you believe it's important or if it's not because you feel like that's the next step in your relationship, if you're just doing it because you're like, we're so in love, then that's the wrong reason to do it. Mm-hmm. So, I, and I'm not saying that you can't fall in love with someone quickly, it's possible, but, you know, I, I think that if... I also think before making big decisions like that, you have to get past that honeymoon phase. You have to think logically. Yeah, and yes. in the very <laughs> beginning of a relationship... Mm-hmm. chemical cocktail phase it's harder to make those decisions but I do understand the people that are saying like well why would you if you truly cared about someone why would you need to live with them because part of marriage is adapting and and compromising which is true mm-hmm. but, but you have to know that you can live with them if there's some people you just can't live with that, that is very true and that's very true mm-hmm. so even if you you're great friends outside of living together some people you can live with, some people you can't. Some people so. just, you just rub each other the wrong way, mm-hmm. you know? So, and I guess it's better, like I said, it's better to know that early than... I, I agree. But, I mean, a lot of people do it as a financial decision. And, you know, if that's a natural step and that also helps you financially, then I sure. think that's okay. I 
I guess my concern would be if that's not a natural step. If it's like, hey, person, I've been seeing like a month. Want to pay half my rent? Yeah, it's that 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 never ends well. By no, the way, it does not. And then you have one person leaving, and then they're like, I have to pay both people's rent. And it, it, it ends up being a mess. Yeah. So just don't do that, So, guys. Don't do yeah, that. Yeah. There's a lot of... There, there's a lot of... And I think that the most millennial thing I can say about this particular debate is to each his or her own or their own. Yes. That it, it's up to whatever couple in, coupling, you know... Yeah. I making the decision. I totally agree with that. And I think that you're right. That is a very millennial thing. <laughs> and I think that it's good to point that out because mm-hmm. it's a, I, I think that's a very important way to be in life. Mm-hmm. You know, what somebody else does, as long as it's not hurting anybody, mm-hmm. why does it matter? Yeah, if it's How not, does it affect me if, if it's, it's not hurting anybody? not hurting you or themselves. And, yeah, I mean, for me... Why does it matter? So to each his own, if that... Is the life that works for you. And I think we actually are more, as a generation, adaptable to different options. Right. Um, whether it's in the workforce or in our personal lives or with family, we're open to more possibilities and there's there's more ways that things can be the norm. Right. I I like to think that as a millennial, I have my my two things that I always think about. I think like a doctor and do, and I say do no harm and I think like Jesus and I say love thy neighbor. If you're doing no harm and loving thy neighbor, then you're doing great. I love that. So <laughs> Yes, let's yeah. all let's all try to do that. Yeah. Do no harm, love, love thy neighbor. neighbor. There we go. So <laughs> as long as you are not doing any harm to anybody and as long as people aren't doing harm to you or themselves or mm-hmm. others, then everything's all good. Mm-hmm. We love what we love other people. For who they are. We don't try to change them. Mm-mm. And I think that is a hallmark of our generation. It's much more open. It's much more socially aware. And I'm not saying that previous generations weren't. So they were socially aware. I just think there was still more of a traditionalist norm. Mm-hmm. And things move over time and, and that can be a good thing. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. You know, we don't want to move too far into anarchy. But, no, but... there's definitely good in accepting... In that kind of accepting nature of the world. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I think that is cool. Um, all right, other misconceptions. I know that I've had issues in the workplace where people have said that we, as millennials, want to get too involved. We want to discuss too much mm. when we're naturally team players. It's one of the, like the huge. That's one of the hallmarks of millennials. Yeah, exactly. Is that we like working in a team and we like feeling like we're contributing. Mm. And one thing that I will say is that I I do like it doesn't have to be a big thing, but I do like having someone say, "Good job," mm-hmm. or "You did well on this assignment." Yeah, like w- positive reinforcement and constructive criticism go a long way with millennials. Yeah, I think there's a millennial thing. I think that is also, going back many podcasts, because I think we did this in the spring, that is also you being a words of affirmation, love love language language person. Right. But in general, millennials are, we do like to be team players. Mm -hmm. And the other generation in the workplace right now that is also open to that is they're the boomers. Mm -hmm. Whereas, and this is no offense to any Xers, but they tend to be more uh, independent, independent, working yeah. by themselves, wanting to get it done alone, that type. And I just, that's yeah, totally I just okay. And in general, just, this is none of this is everybody. No. So I know that I, I sometimes I'm like, well, they're like, why, why do you need to discuss it with everybody? But there is kind of a thing with like boomers and millennials and the people mm-hmm. you end up working with the most. Right. You know, it's it's that kind of mm-hmm. dynamic. Uh, not that some extras are not in that team spirit. They definitely are. But I, I tend to see those dynamics play out more. Mm-hmm. So you said you had a few other misconceptions. I do. So another misconception is that millennials do not believe in God. So this misconception is actually not particularly true. According to my research, while 25% are not affiliated with a specific faith, so that could be... They are just like a la carte spiritual or they are, some of them are atheists or agnostic. Whether it's that or anything else, 
the it's less structured, but the actual amount who believe in God percentage hasn't changed since the last generation. Hmm. So we believe in God or a higher power, a higher power or a spirit, whatever your particular version of it is, a religion, a higher power. We believe we have spiritual religious beliefs Mm -hmm. in the same percentages as baby boomers did. We are, because it, it goes along with the millennial thing of being team players, being more open, being interested in different versions of things we are more likely to consider several religions and kind of pick pieces from different religions Mm -hmm. and many will say they're spiritual in general but in general religion it may not look the same way it may not be as structured so they may not say like i am a presbyterian and that is all i am Mm -hmm. or whatever your religion is i just you know said that one (laughs) but they may not say that but they might say, yeah, I'm a, I'm a Christian. I'm a general Christian. Yeah. Or, yes, I believe in, in God. And mm-hmm. I like this piece of Judaism. I like this piece of Christianity. I like this piece of Islam. So they'll pick different things. Or some people believe in multiple gods. Which, you know, by the way, with you, you mentioned Judaism, Islam, and Christianity. The whole Old Testament stories... They're basically all the same, guys. Stop being so <laughs> close-minded. Anyway. Yeah. Continue. <laughs> but we're not any less religious no. as a whole. That was just my point. We're not any less religious. No. Um, I already said we're not home ownership averse. That that has to do with the economy. Yeah. Um, the entitlement one we talked about. Um, oh, the job hopping one. Oh. So... On average, yes, millennials do change jobs more frequently than previous generations. However, it has to do with the, because of the environment, the economy, the lack of advancement potentials in many, many places. Mm-hmm. Um, we're actually less happy than the extras were in their 20s. Mm-hmm. And it has a lot to do with the advancement potentials and the types of jobs that we, it, it goes back to the underemployment, the types of jobs that many of us are working in many of us are working in part-time jobs or underemployed jobs and those statistics get thrown in thrown in there like of course you're going to leave a job where you aren't appreciated for your talent and you're not mm-hmm. able to advance yourself of course you're going to leave however um a large amount of millennials would like do stay in jobs and they do have just as much loyalty to their companies and their employers if it is a place where they can grow Hey, Charles, guess how long I've been working at my job? Five years? Mm-hmm. I knew it was five years. I, I did know that. Loyalty. Loyalty, yes. But so, the the company I work for also is incredibly open to listening to communication, even from across the ocean. They, mm-hmm. they make sure that I feel involved, that even though I'm the only person in the U.S., that I have a voice within the community. So yes. it's important to millennials to have a voice in the community. <laughs> Yeah. Did you know we're four times more likely than our grandparents to hold a degree? I did not know that. I think that's pretty cool, too. It's pretty cool. Yeah, so what did I not talk about yet? Well, I think something that we didn't discuss, um, we kind of covered it in dates, but there is a trick for people that are worried about like whether or not they are a millennial or if they're an Xer and I know, or an iGen. Xer or an iGen. And you know what, guys, if you're on the cusp, whatever you believe you are, you are, if you feel like you are wise beyond your years and you are, you know, just under the age that is millennials, you could call yourself a millennial. If you feel like you are really young at heart, but you're just over the age, we could take you guys too. Or if you're an elder millennial and you feel like you can't like you're an Xer, Xer, then, you, you're, an then Xer. you're an Xer. I've heard people say that they're Xennials. I've, yeah, I've heard Xennials because they, they feel like they, they cross over. So that Xennial yeah. group, that's... I hear a lot of, like, mid to late 30s say yeah. they're exennials. Um, yeah, and that's kind of, it has to do with how you perceive yourself. But there is a trick mm-hmm. for you to determine where you naturally fall. Now, we did say it's approximately 1983 to 1996. Mm-hmm. But a good way to determine that, do you want to? Sure. So Do the first half? Yeah. Yeah, so if you want to determine whether or not you are a Generation Xer, then you ask yourself the following question. Do I remember the Challenger explosion? 
if you can remember the Challenger explosion, then you are likely a Generation Xer. Mm-hmm. If you can't, then You're go to the next one up, which is a millennial. Mm-hmm. So, and on the other end, the millennials and iGens. Mm-hmm. If you can say yes to the question, do I remember 9-11, you're a millennial. Mm-hmm. If you do not remember 9-11, you're an iGen. So even if you were born and you... If you were born pre-9-11, if you are born in 2000, you don't remember 9-11. Okay. No. So it would be people who were conscious about, about 1996. You may be someone who has some memories from before that age, so mm-hmm. you may have been like two or three and remember everybody being upset, then you're kind of on the cusp. You could consider yourself a millennial or an iGen. Right. For but I- generally speaking, 96, so 22 is about the lowest age. Mm-hmm. But I know some 22-year-olds who, I forget that they're 22 because they are super mature, they're in the adult world, mm-hmm. um, so they connect more with the millennials. Mm-hmm. Um, I also know some you know, 23, 24 year olds who are young at heart connect more with the iGens and same on the other end of the spectrum with the Xers and the millennials. So you are what you believe you are. And these are all just kind of general beliefs about these, these groups. But, you know, we wanted to point out because I, I like being a millennial. I think it's, I do too. I think it's very cool. And, you know, we've had to defend ourselves against a lot of, (laughs) A lot of attacks, um, and I think that's the misconception of using millennial as a synonym for young. And every generation, when they're young, does stupid young things. Every generation. You did too, grandparents of us. I'm sure the greatest in the silence were like, oh god, what are they doing? What? <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> when the other generations were growing up. Yep. So... Especially boomers, like they were the hippie generation. Like I'm it's sorry, like, oh my god, guys! You, you guys, you guys did some young and stupid things. We love you guys, but you did some things too. Yeah, we've all done some things. And you know, as millennials now, we're growing into solidly adulthood mm-hmm. versus mini adults. I call mini adults the age that's like college through a couple years 25. after. Maybe 25, it depends on the person. Some people are adult adults by like 23, 24. Some people, Mm -hmm. not so much. So mini adult is basically when you are legally an adult, but your brain is just not an adult. When you feel like a teenager. I I started, my crossover into feeling like I was actually an adult was the first time I moved out. So I was about 24, 25. Um, That was my crossover into feeling like a real adult. Before that, I kind of felt like a big teenager. And that's what I call mini adult because you're technically an adult, but you're still, your brain still lives in teenager land. I I think my, my crash course is when six months after graduation, it was like, pay $800 a month to us. And I was like, okay, Sally Mae. That was when I felt like I was an adult. And I'm like, I don't think I like this. (laughs) So. Oh, this is a good wrap up. Okay. How do you know when you're an adult? Actually, I was having a really funny conversation at a different conference <laughs> with a mixed group of colleagues. One of us was uh, um, right on the cusp of millennial iGen. Mm-hmm. Um, there were a couple millennials, a bunch of Xers, um, a couple baby boomers, and we were all talking about what we felt like we were adults. Yeah. And we each shared a story of a time that all of us we're in a situation where our brains went to, I need to find an adult. When we were all an adult. Uh-huh. And um, then you realize you're an adult. And you realize you're an adult. And I thought it was just me, but then no, my colleague who was like, too. who's 55 was like, oh my God, I just did that last week. And I'm like, oh my God, thank God. So I think it's one of those things that... <laughs> when something happens and you're like, who's in charge here? Oh yeah. shit, it's me. <laughs> <laughs> I think sometimes adulting is fake it till you make it. It really, really In many, is. many instances. But I think that... You're an adult when, well, to me, I felt the most adult, or I felt like I changed from child to adult the first time I studied abroad, when I was 20 to 21. Hmm. Um, I felt like I 100% changed into an adult the second time I studied abroad, and my financial aid didn't come in. And there When was, you were in grad school. When I was in grad school, yeah. so I was, I was 23, mm-hmm. and... My financial aid didn't come in one month. It eventually had come in three weeks late. But for those three weeks, I ended up 
working under the table <laughs> for professors gardening to make enough money so that I could for buy groceries. the basic groceries. <laughs> like, it was... Like, one of those moments where I'm like, I can do this. But at the same time, like, I wanted to cry, but I'm like, I am 23. I am an adult. And that's when I realized that I was really an adult. And that See, is so like... See, so you were a little bit younger so. than I was then. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I... It's not that I didn't think I was an adult at about 23, but mm-hmm. it was really about 24. 24, 25. Once all my bills were my own. hmm That was the real shock to the system <laughs> for me. I'm like, I bank account and stay there. Yeah, no, it, comes out. <laughs> it comes right back out. Sometimes faster than it goes in. Often faster than it goes in. That's also the month I learned to drink black coffee because guess what, guys? I couldn't. It has fewer calories. It's it's a calorie free beverage. I, I bought the things that I bought. So uh, <laughs> the things I bought during those three weeks. First of all, my professor ended up feeding me lunch every time I um, did Yay, work in, in her backyard because I did landscaping, thankfully, because my uncles, John and Brian, hired me at the marina for summer so I knew how to landscape. So edge, mulch, mow lawns, etc. And then she paid me like a small portion after lunch because she asked if I preferred to eat and get less pay or just get all pay and I said I preferred to eat <laughs> and get more pay because I knew at least at lunch I would get a good meal <laughs> and then I used the rest of the money to buy black coffee eggs oatmeal carrots and peanut butter those are good things that's what I ate for three weeks hey you you hit the major food groups I did so good job and I went to chaplaincy to see sister Sarah and father John and they also fed me food sometimes because they could tell that it was just not a it good time. They took pity. They took so much pity. <laughs> but, like, you, you you really appreciate people around you and your networks when stuff like that happens. And that's why... You do. And that's why I give back when I can. <laughs> as do, what was it, 81% as, as of do, millennials. 81% of our group, even though we're underemployed and, <laughs> and lazy, apparently. We're still giving to charity. <laughs> we're still giving Woo. to charity. Um... <laughs> Yeah, no, I I totally agree. There's always that moment where it's like, oh, wait, I'm the adult. I'm the adult. Oh, no. And then you get, like, that sinking, like, oh, no. And then you realize you can deal (laughs) with it, and then you're fine. Well, all the time. Because, like, you know, I'm a teacher. There's always, like, this kid is doing this, and this kid's over here. Like, who's in charge here? What what do I do? (laughs) Oh, right. I have to do this. Um, Yeah, so there's always that. Or on an airplane, when someone's next to you, and they're like, do you know what's wrong with the plane? When there's turbulence, and you just lie out that. Like, Something's wrong with the left phalange. <laughs> Thank you, Pete Buffet. <laughs> but, no, I feel like I always feel like an adult on an airplane because I always look very calm because I travel so much mm. and I'm always next to the nervous flyer. So I always pretend to know a lot more about flying than I actually do mm-hmm. to calm people down. And I feel like a huge adult then. Yeah. The adultiest of adults, as it is. Adult as, adult. It, as it were. Yeah. Yes. So yeah, well, mini adult is what I call college and beginning of your 20s when you don't actually feel like an adult yet. Right. But you know, there's a lot of growth in mini adulthood. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, random fun facts that didn't really have to do with any of the themes we were in, like the money thing and the entitlement thing and uh, the marriage and all of that. Random fun facts. 83% disapprove of smoking. You realize it... it I don't know why. Cancer. You're like, why would you smoke? And lung disease. You know, why? Why do you? Why would people smoke? It's just... That's, that's, At this point, we know it does. Yeah. Why? And it's no longer considered classy as it was for previous generations. It's just <clears throat> kind of not a cool thing. On average, a millennial uses, whether it's their own personal ones or at work, 7.7 connected devices during, like, a, a week. So... Your computer at work, your computer at home, your smart TV, your phone, your tablet, like all these different things. 7.7. It's a lot of connection. You have four. I have four. So you're under average. Let me see. Wait. One, two, three, four. I'm over. But I have 10 iPads that I use for my students. So I deal with all 10 iPads on a weekly basis. Yeah. I have my, so, my phone, my work computer. My personal computer, and then whatever smart TV is. I'm way, I'm way over then, because of all of my stuff for the kids. Yeah, and my my job is just me. Yeah, your job is just you. So I work, I work with kids. I have a set of iPads that I use for them. I have work computer, home computer, phone, tablet, Mm -hmm. TV, 
all kinds of things. So I, I'm over that average, but you're under. So it's, yeah, it's yeah. average. All right. There we go. Um, cool. So that's one. Um, 83% have Facebook. I was surprised it's not more than 83% actually. I believe millennials are the biggest generation on Facebook too yeah. because the iGens don't use it as much. They're more Instagrammers and mm-hmm. Snapchatters than they yeah. are anything else. 39% have tattoos. Kayla's raising her hand. So you can't see Kayla, but she's <laughs> raising her hand as one of the millennials who has tattoos. I don't. Kayla does. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's interesting too because for many previous generations, tattoos were seen as maybe like a lower class thing. And I think they're becoming more of a classy, accepted form of self-expression. An art, an artsy an art type form. thing. Yeah, an art form. Um, and depending on the person and what they have, it can sometimes be like a, an extension of their personality and themselves. Mm-hmm. So that's cool. And like, you know, you have meaningful tattoos. Yes. So I think that's cool. 59% are Christian compared to 72% of our parents. Mm-hmm. So that specific group has gone down. But like I said, there's no less religion in general. It just has changed how it looks. 84% don't trust advertising and would rather <laughs> believe a friend's recommendation. Mm-hmm. It's another fun fact. And we're also, um, between us and the iGens, um, yeah. we're also the most connected generations. Mm-hmm. So internationally connected. We we grew up learning that we could send we could an email talk or to people talk to people across, people the, across world. the world. And, and we do. Many of us mm-hmm. do talk to people across the world. I do you do every time. day. Every day. <laughs> you do much more. You have so many international friends. I'm actually giving you credit for how many international listeners we have to this. So hello, international listeners. <laughs> we keep getting more countries, and I think that's you because I don't know people in these countries. Or you're just finding us. And if you're just finding us and you don't know either of us, welcome. Yes, thank welcome you so much. Welcome, new friends. Welcome. It's exciting to and have... I promise I'm working on trying to get a, a handle on a second language. I'm so ashamed. <laughs> working on it. Well, we, we already talked about that in a different I know, episode. Different about, episode. So about you all that. know. We but... all know this, unless we haven't listened to that yet. And that was the education episode, episode 15, I believe. Or something around there, if okay. I'm wrong. Okay, so uh, last thoughts on being a millennial or maybe confusion between millennials and iGens. Um... Advice for iGens? I I think my last thoughts in general just have to do with the fact that these generation groups, just like anything else, just like a love language or an MBTI, they're all meant to help us in the workplace better understand each other. And I think that we need to make sure that we're still looking at these generation groups as that way rather than a way to blame generations or a certain group for something else. So we need to remember that these are put here to help us. They They were created so that we could get along better. Let's not become the worst parts of ourselves and use them as a mechanism to blame someone Mm -hmm. that's not ourselves. Because I just feel like, you know, I I fall into that trap where I'm just like, oh my gosh, this like, this ex and let me like work in a team or, and I find myself doing it too. So it's not just one generation. Right, and and that... even, even what you just said, that was a generalization against Xers. Exactly. So, so, you know, I think, I guess the takeaway is each generation has their own unique, <sighs> awesome things. And let's focus on the positive. And I think hopefully this, a lot of people like to hate on millennials. Um, hopefully this gave you some more information about mm-hmm. who we really are. And we're not all the same, clearly. Right. And... And there's enough of the blame game going around in our country right now. Let's not add this to the list of things we blame other people for. Mm-hmm. Just try to be the best that you can be in the workplace. And yeah, We're all fine in our own way. Mm-hmm. And I guess maybe I would like to say as a last kind of thing, um, remember that these generation names aren't used as a slight. Mm-hmm. And it's not a synonym for young, especially mm-hmm. since there aren't any underage millennials any longer. <laughs> but even if you are saying something against... Young people, let's not hate on the iGens either. No. They are very connected, very aware. They are very curious. Um, they're hard workers. They, they're just, they're a cool group. They're young. Mm-hmm. So they will have young people's experiences, mm-hmm. young experiences. Um, but let's not say things against them either. Because, you know, you guys, teenagers, 
early 20s people in the I generation, we're happy that we have you too. And you guys are the next group coming up into our spot here. So we would love to talk to you guys. Mm -hmm. And it's good to have friends in all the different generations. It is. And to piggyback on that, never forget that teaching can go both ways. That just as much as these iGens and maybe some of the millennials can teach the Xers and the boomers about some of the stuff that's happening with technology and with social media and everything, the boomers and the Xers can teach our generations about not as aware of because mm-hmm. technology has made it easier for us to do things and or shortcut something. Mm-hmm. So if there's something you want to teach us, approach it as a teachable moment as opposed to something, an attacking moment, mm-hmm. you, regardless of what side you're coming from. So mm-hmm. I think that's important. Cool. We can all learn from one another. Generation harmony. <laughs> yes. Generation harmony. <laughs> And it works. My office is a whole bunch of different people. And it works. Mm -hmm. Because we all communicate. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. All right, guys. Well, whatever generation you are in, Mm -hmm. embrace the best of it. Mm -hmm. Hope you learned a little more about our generation. We would love to hear more about your generation. Yes, please tell us more. We always love to hear any comments you have. And if there are any topics you'd like us to cover, we Mm -hmm. certainly have brains all over the place. Always, like I said. We have lots to say, can you tell? Yeah, we we don't talk that much. No, we're we're actually really shy. Really, really shy. But (laughs) if you want to bring us out of our shells, then you should give us topics to research Mm -hmm. and discuss because we're nerds, so we like to research topics. You this week. I know we usually do a weekly reminder. I set my phone and I just say your mind shall see that I'm a nerd. She's a nerd. It's all right. And you know what? This is another thing that I like about our generation. We own this stuff. We do. It's not like, don't call me a nerd. Oh, my goodness. I'm like, yeah, I'm a nerd, man. <laughs> proud of it. Proud. proud to be a millennial. Proud to be a nerd. Mm-hmm. Be proud of who you are. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. That's the takeaway. Have a great week. Have a great week, everyone. And stay tuned for our next podcast. As always, thanks for listening. See you next time. You've been listening to The Sapio Files. Thank you so much, all generations, for tuning in this week. And remember, we love to hear from you. You can contact us at sapiofilespodcast at gmail.com, on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or YouTube at The Sapio Files. Leave us a comment, rate and review us on the iTunes app or anywhere else that you listen to this podcast. Have a wonderful week. And always, stay curious.